This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, startups, and projects driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we'll be exploring a very special niche or ecosystem of blockchain technology. We'll be exploring the intersection of real estate and blockchains. Uh, we are joined by Stephen and Russell who are building Rex MLS. So MLS stands for multiple listing system. We'll get into what, what this is. But it's, it's one of the first projects that really pioneer how blockchains can change the real estate industry. So we thought it was a really interesting project to cover. Before we start, let's have an introduction from Russell and Stephen. So Russell, you go first. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, look, I've, I've been uh, in the cryptocurrency scene for, for the last five or so years and uh, working with uh, Bitcoin and, um, and moving on to Ripple and BitShares and Next and, and now Ethereum. And uh, yeah, I, I, Ethereum addresses some of the shortcomings that these other platforms uh, have had. And uh, yeah, we're, I'm really excited to, uh, to be building Rex on, on Ethereum and uh, achieving what we want to achieve. Cool. And Stephen, a bit about your background. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for having us. Um, my background is in commercial real estate. I've been in it for about five years now. I run uh, King Realty Group here in New Jersey, and I do deals uh, throughout the United States. I've um, been involved in some development work as well, and I have worked on some technology startups, which uh, has actually led me into uh, Ethereum, and I am the founder of Princeton Ethereum Meetup. Rex MLS, as I said, is one of the first projects I came across that really merges blockchain technology and the real estate side. Now, uh, most probably the real estate side won't be well known to our listeners. So let's get into what an MLS really is. So could, could you explain what is an MLS and what is it used for? Sure. So uh, a multiple listing service is essentially a large database that disseminates real estate information and the information is sourced and then sold back to the brokerage community. Um, it also helps facilitate contracts, um, broker cooperation, and sometimes helps with appraisals. Uh, but the, the abstract that it provides of the property are basically the price, the location, uh, the size or the occupancy of the building, and the operating expenses. Um, there are three segments. Uh, there are there's commercial, which we're focused on to start. There's residential, and there's multifamily. How long have uh, MLS systems been around for? They've been around since the 1800s. Uh, a bunch of guys got in a room, and it basically, uh, in, at least in North America, it was down in DC. And it was a way of help me sell mine and I'll help you sell yours. Uh, but it's um, matured to where over the years, it, you know, as technology developed, um, it, a couple of uh, different companies created platforms to uh, disseminate the, real, the information on a much broader basis. Um, and some of the large uh, companies in North America are in the commercial industry are CoStar and LoopNet and on the residential side are Zillow and Trulia and then there's uh, local multiple listing services which are state by state and they're owned by independent brokerage houses. Uh, a lot of the multifamily platforms are owned by most of the residential guys. And so in the real estate industry, how much power do these uh, systems, these MLS uh, systems have? What is, what is their impact on the real estate industry? It's quite significant. So um, CoStar was, uh, was started in the 80s by a guy named Andy Florence. And he's a business guy. It started a technology company. And his business model is simple. He's got a slew of researchers 
they contact different brokerage houses, obtain their listing information, and then publish it on their platform. And they've made significant traction and they're able to charge $3,500 a year per certificate. So uh, this, is, this leads to two problems. One, if you're a large brokerage house and you have multiple brokers and you want to use more than one computer to basically access this information, it gets quite expensive. And it also affects the, uh, the small to medium sized brokerage houses because it adds significantly to their overhead. Now, like I said, they, they've been around since the 80s, so they've been able to make traction. Uh, their one competitor that, that made traction as well was LoopNet. LoopNet, their uh, paywall was much lower than CoStar in that they charged about $160 a month to access their data. And it was more of an open system. It wasn't just brokers. It was mom and pop retailers and, and office users. And But what happened about 12 months ago, CoStar bought LoopNet. And LoopNet has been a mess ever since. And they're actually in talks right now about raising their prices by 60% in the next 12 months, which, which makes, it gives them, I'm surprised it got through the regulatory process in the United States, but it made, uh, they basically have an unofficial monopoly. Is that, is that right that CoStar still gathers all this data manually, right? And uh, then feeds it into their own MLS system and then sells access to this database to all parties interested in it. Yeah, so they, I mean, I'll get calls from CoStar once or twice a week and they'll be looking for not only listing information, but deal information. So they'll want to know, you know, hey, w what deal did you close over at X, you know, address? So they want to know how long the lease was, who the tenant is, uh, the economics involved. And then they publish that, they sell that to other uh, brokers on their platform. And the problem with that is the information has become unreliable because no intelligent broker is going to give correct information because if they do that, if they say, well, I just did a deal for a five-year lease and, um, and, uh, and they publish that on their website, another broker is going to call that tenant in four years and say, hey, I know your lease is up in another year and I've got a property across the street and I can save you 20% on your rent. So a lot of the, the brokers have realized that they're doing this and have just given either little or, or just bad information. So with this bad information, how does this system still work? Why does it work if, uh, if the brokers are themselves not incentivized to give correct information? It works because they have scale and because there's nothing else out there that you can turn to quickly and find this information. So before the internet, um, Black Sky and a couple of other companies published a biannual report of information. They had CoStar's model, but they just published it in a book. And CoStar, they've been able to make this information uh, more relevant than it was back then. So if a guy wants to, if a broker wants to go and find 10,000 feet, they don't want to search across multiple platforms to do that and make multiple calls. They want to just look at one database, see what's available, and then call the listing agent and obtain more information. They don't, they're not in the, all they want to do is find the space and do the deal. They don't want to be bothered by navigating or, or finding new information. So it's sort of this closed system that hasn't changed. And a lot of companies have, t have tried to disrupt this uh, with conventional technology, and it, it, they just they're not able to get the traction that CoStar has. Well, that was my next question. So, I mean, in 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 sort of banking and finance, we're seeing you know you know all these fintech startups come in and try to disrupt uh, large banks and financial institutions. Are we seeing the same kind of trend in in real estate? Is is that also happening in real estate to try to disrupt these large uh, uh, monopolies, essentially? I would say, so real estate is the, the last industry typically to um, get on board with new technology. Um, they, you know, typically developers want to develop and brokers want to just find and source and do deals. Um, however, the, the costs have gotten exponentially higher over the last five, six, seven, eight years. So when we started talking about Rex, we, we gone to a, a couple of conferences, one which is the International Real Estate Blockchain Conference uh, run out in Newport. And it's interesting to us because the real estate community is excited about what we're trying to do uh, because they realize that it's going to disrupt the existing systems in a way that will benefit 
the end user um, and will free up the information. So CoStar has obviously, they, they, they pissed off the community enough where a lot of these, a lot of the development in the brokerage community are, yeah, they are. They're, they wanted to see it disrupted, which is an interesting sign for me being in the business because like I said, a lot of these guys are, are you know, they're not technologically advanced like some of these other industries. So uh, what you're proposing is a decentralized MLS uh, system that you'd call Rex MLS. Um, what, uh, what, what excites you about uh, building a decentralized MLS system? Well, there's a couple things. So uh, Ethereum in particular uh, gives us the opportunity to mesh together the blockchain, data distribution, and currency all under one roof. And, and that's important because the blockchain basically gives us um, it helps us timestamp transactions and it, it keeps a um, reliable uh, track record of the transactions. Uh, the data distribution, we're using IPFS and Russell talk more about this, but it's, it's basically, um, it makes the, the data that we're trying to obtain exponentially cheaper across the board and it'll basically be free. And, and this information should be free. And currency um, we're able to use through Ethereum and that'll help fuel our platform and um, the, the other thing that, it, that it's helping is right now there's no universal system. So uh, there's, no, there's no global system in where a guy in China who wants to buy an investment property in New York can access or do some research on his own before he calls his broker. Uh, he's got to find out what the, the local system is in New York. And on a residential basis, it's even worse because it's on a state-by-state -state basis. It's not even across international borders. So to get that information, you have to pay for each individual multiple listing service on a, in a very local level. So it sort of it brings everything together for us, and it opens up it opens up this closed system. What is sort of the you know, potential uh, advantages that you see for for brokers? I mean, is Obviously, you know, there's, there's cost cutting, uh, right? As, as, as you described in the white paper, uh, these multiple listing services charge quite a lot uh, to have listings, you know, set up as premium, you know, so that they can be visible, etc. Uh, aside from having uh, the cost of listings go down dramatically, what other advantages uh, can, you, can you see for a system like this? Well, so... There's, there's a couple of different uh, advantages. The, the first and foremost is that we're bringing all this data into one place. So right now, commercial and residential, and basically commercial and residential uh, are separated. And we're going to bring them together under one roof. So nowadays, commercial guys are doing residential deals, and residential guys are doing commercial deals. They're not two completely different industries. They are, but they're, they're starting to commingle. Um, so that's one benefit. The, the other benefit is that the, um, the cost, obviously, what you mentioned, will, will go down significantly. And we're going to initially pay the brokerage community, or anybody for that matter, to upload listings to Rex, um, and especially verified listings. And that, that turns the tide the other way, in that instead of taking money from the community, we're actually paying you to uh, obtain that information. And What's interesting about that is not only have we gotten, uh, we've held a, a few meetings with people uh, throughout the country uh, in the real estate community who have gotten excited about that idea and even people that aren't in the real estate community who are like, hey, I live in Minneapolis or I live in uh, Singapore. If I, if I'm, if I know the, the local market and I've got a property or from a landlord, can I upload that and get paid as well, uh, which is something that Russ and I didn't think about. Um, we said, sure, of course you can. That sounds really interesting because one of my questions was if you're assuming that like CoStar basically does manual data gathering from all the brokers, then how does, how would you bring all of the data into your platform? So right now I'm assuming that Rex MLS is essentially like a decentralized database. That's, that's the imagination that comes to my mind that you have records about properties and you might have certain fields in each of these records that record what kind of property it is, uh, et cetera, where it is, et cetera. And all of these records are stored inside IPFS. Like, is, is, is that correct? Like, what are the basic components of your technical architecture? Yeah, that's correct. So um, 
we are storing the records in IPFS and uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Kappa infrastructure model where it's 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 a append only style of database where it, uh, each user um, creates a new record that super, that it, that is added on top of uh, the previous records. Um, there, there's there's an example of a system out there at the moment called Patchwork, which is doing this for um, a, a social network, and uh, and it's and it's working really well. We investigated using. Uh, this Kappa infrastructure, and it's it's ideally suited for um, smaller scale projects, I, I believe. Uh, we, we've got smaller social networks; uh, it, it works great. But when you start to scale to hundreds of thousands of of users, it, it, it can be hard to keep track of, um, you know, where where each user is up to. Uh, so we We've continued that approach with the Kappa infrastructure, but we have merged it with Ethereum and we are using Ethereum to timestamp uh, when these users are uh, you know, appending to their log. So we can go to one place, we can go to Ethereum and we, and we can say, give me the hash of the state of the database right now. And it will there, and we can then straight away see uh, you know where each of these users uh, append only log is up to. Um, so IPFS is basically we're storing all the, all of these the users state in IPFS and we're using Ethereum to merge it all together and get a get a quick glimpse of where the entire system is at. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J A XX.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. Let's imagine me as a broker, right? Now, when I enter, so I, I open up the DAP, I, I I make a listing. So I say, somebody, let's say somebody came to me and said, uh, he wants to rent out this particular commercial property. That commercial property has a certain set of parameters. And I want to search for a counterparty for this person. So I create a listing and I list this data. Where does this data data go? Like what, what happens after that? And how is the hash in Ethereum finally updated? What's the flow from, from this point to the final point? Yeah, so obviously all the uh, complexities are hidden from the user and the, and the user interface, but they will basically uh, type in their, all their parameters and the information about the listing. Uh, it will go and create a uh, an IPFS Merkle DAG uh, object, uh, get a hash for it, and it, it will do some housekeeping behind the scenes of, of that user's um, state, and it'll 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 log down what their last state was, what their new state is, uh, and it will add that that new hash to the top of the list, and then. Uh, and then you'll get a master hash, which is, you know, basically a summary of all that information all bundled bundled up into one hash. And then it will create an Ethereum transaction, which will submit that hash uh, into the Ethereum blockchain, uh, and it raises a log, you know, an event uh, log for it. Uh, and then basically the Rex MLS system uh, subscribes to that event log 
and every time a uh, a new hash comes in, it basically then goes and asks IPFS, okay, give me that hash, uh, give me the content for that hash, uh, and and basically drills down and 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 downloads all the data that it needs. It'll download uh, all the fields, uh, the description, uh, any photos that have been um, attached, um, and that kind of stuff. So this system doesn't have any notion of privacy, right? Like whatever goes into the system, whatever any broker puts into the system is visible to everybody else. That's correct. Yep. So eh, users are basically, it's up to them to decide how much information they put into the system. So uh, a private seller might not want to reveal too much information. They might just want to put maybe a phone number or an email address or something like that. Whereas a broker would probably want to market themselves in this system and uh, and add probably a company logo, uh, you know, your office address, um, you know, phone number, uh, you know, uh, that and and that broker uh, personality or profile that is in the system would probably start to build up some reputation. So you'd want to see. Uh, you know, that uh, this broker has successfully done, you know, X number of deals or, um, you know, and perhaps even build some sort of feedback system in there so that buyers and sellers can rate each other and, and, and boost the broker's profile. So in that case, the broker would want, would want to put a reasonable amount of information in there. Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to the users to decide what they put into the system. Okay, interesting. You mentioned reputation. Now, we'll, I think we'll come back to that uh, a bit later. Um, for now, let's stay on this technical infrastructure. Uh, regarding IPFS, who is storing the data? Like, what ensures that it's just always available uh, for the peers to download it? Uh, currently, we are hosting uh, several nodes uh, on the IPFS network that will host the data. Um, eventually, uh, we we will see. Uh, users who are enthusiastic about the system who want to run a full node and it is it is a little bit challenging to run a full node it, to run ethereum and ipfs and uh, rex uh, all at once it requires a little bit of uh, of know-how so those people who are enthusiastic will probably want to run a node and uh, run all those all three of those systems and 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 they will be able to choose whether they want to download all the data or uh, or whether they just want to download perhaps uh, one country that they're interested in. Maybe they just want to. Maybe they're only interested in um, United States commercial property, so they'll only download that data and they'll ignore the rest. And then you'll get some operators who who want to just store everything or all the countries, all the markets. So is this sort of a closed IPFS? Uh network of nodes or is this operating on sort of the you know primary IPFS network? Yeah it's currently running on the primary IPFS network and I don't see any reason to uh, separate it and run on a separate network it, it seems to be running fine at the moment. Okay so then I mean I haven't stayed completely up to date with what's going on with IPFS I think they were at some point working on some system to incentivize users to provide data. I think it was called Filecoin. Um, it, it, is this something that basically could extend then to you know anyone using IPFS would be able to store this data, or are we restri- would we be restricted to uh, only those those people using uh, Rex MLS? Uh, no, absolutely. I think uh, IPFS their their uh, incentivization is scheme is called um, Filecoin and uh, it, it, it's entirely possible that uh, we could incentivize uh, people to to store the content using Filecoin. I mean that would give us a better distribution uh, of the data rather than a handful of nodes uh, hosting it themselves. Um, but uh, you know there's also uh, Ethereum Swarm is uh, being developed uh, and they're going to have their own incentivization mechanisms so uh, yeah look we're we're pretty flexible at this stage so uh, we'll evaluate swarm when it comes along and uh, and we'll monitor how the distribution of the data is going and and adjust accordingly okay 
So let's talk about the user experience a little bit. So tell us how um, you know if from from all all perspectives, because you know you have you have the, the brokers and you also have the uh, people you know, looking to purchase a property. Um, walk us through the user experience for for someone using Rex MLS. Yeah, look the. <laughs> The user interface is always a tricky, a tricky part of it. Uh, we've we've tried to build a, a UI that's uh, as user friendly as possible, but uh, there's just some concepts uh, in the crypto world that are <laughs> that are difficult for regular users to comprehend. Uh, creating wallets and backing up seed phrases and that sort of stuff. So our initial release uh, is pretty much targeted to tech savvy people uh, and you will have to ma manage all of that on your own um, but we see in the future that uh, well, we will be investing uh, resources into improving the UI but uh, we also see down the track uh, a need for a, a UI that pretty much strips out all of that uh, all of that crypto stuff and and basically just gives them a, a UI that says uh, list your property put in your fields and hit go uh, and it and it'll forward on their request to a uh, you know a publishing house or a publishing um, site that will basically take care of the crypto stuff for them. So it'll it'll uh, bundle that into the appropriate transaction, uh, uh, pay the eth uh, fee and the rex fee uh, for them, and uh, and list it on their behalf. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the only way to to go because not everyone. Uh, not everyone is as keen as uh, as us for the for the new world of decentralization. So we've got to cater for them as well. So the interesting part about this kind of architecture of uh, an MLS is that, in in theory, now there could be hundreds of so like hundreds of services that display this data, right? So if I'm a, if I'm a broker, I might in the future have an option of like five different services that run on the same data of Rex MLS, which is on IPFS, but uh, display things differently. And I might like one way of displaying the data over another. So for example, in one system, if I might search uh, properties in New Jersey, I might get a set of results. In another system, I search properties in New Jersey, I might get a different, different set of results. And maybe the second one is is better suited to me. So I can choose that user interface right yeah no absolutely um the the ui and the and the system that we have built uh it, it can be hosted by anyone uh very easily so we expect that uh there will be you know potentially 10 different websites hosting the same uh rex ui so you, you could go to any one of these sites and uh, create your listings or uh, or search for properties, uh, and, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, people will customize it. People will tweak it. Uh, people will uh, hone in on particular areas that people uh, will find of interest. Um, and the other interesting thing is that the existing uh, players uh, in the in the space. Uh, here in Australia, like uh, realestate.com.au, uh, there's no reason why they can't inc pull our data out of Rex MLS and include it uh, in their in their results as well. Um, so yeah, uh, the data is free for everybody to use. Which we can't do that right now. I, I try, we try to do that with another app. I try to pull uh, data off a of LoopNet, and it's. It's a, it's you can do it well. You can't do it anymore, but it violates all sorts of end user licensing agreements. And that was some of the discussion that Russ and I had that we wanted this thing to be completely opened. And and like Russ said, any of these uh, current brokerage uh, platforms can pull the data. So I think the 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 central challenge with a system like Rex MLS seems to be how do you incentivize brokers to put data in, and and how do you prevent kind of civil attacks like like data which is not correct uh entering into the system because some party wants to let's say spam the system so what's the what's your what's your idea for incentivizing brokers to put put actually put data into the system well so the first part of that i i can take uh 
the incentivization, the to incentivize them, we are what we talked about. We're paying them to get on the system, but the the incentivization is is already there. Uh, the pricing, like I said, for a lot of these other platforms, especially in the commercial sector, which we're focused on, um, are exponentially high, and they're adding overhead to the large CBREs, Cushman and Wakefields, um, even big, uh, large investment uh, companies like Blackstone in New York City. Uh, it's it's incredible how much it, it's adding to their overhead, and then you've got smaller firms like uh, myself and um, and other you know local brokerage houses, where again it's the 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 pricing keeps going up, and LoopNet has been an alternative to CoStar uh, in terms of uh, price, and it's going from something that's been not, not reasonable but at least affordable. And now it's going to jump from 160 to like 250 or 260, something uh, ridiculous. It's going to go way up. And they're also going to loop in. Uh, you're going to have to pay for some of the plugins on top of that. So it's going to end up being about $350 a month. Um, and it, it, the, the, the larger houses can, can afford this and take this on. But they're, they're right now, the meetings that we've taken, they're investing in companies like ourselves. Uh, we've actually had a couple of larger uh, companies talk to us about investing in RECs because they're trying to come up with an alternative means. And when we talk about IPFS and data decentralization, it's, it's amazing how, exciting, how excited they get about that. And um, so that's, that's, that's really the, the big incentive here uh, for both large and small companies. And in terms of... Um, spamming the network. Uh, Russ, I'll let you attune to that. You you had a um, pretty good response for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're basically like two approaches to combat uh, spam and, and you know, uh, uh, fake listings and what have you. Uh, firstly is you will need a small amount of Rex token to uh, create a listing uh, where we're aiming for it to be pretty insignificant, you know, around the 10 cents or 20 cents or something like that. Just enough so you've got some skin in the game to uh, to, to post content on there. Um, and the other approach is uh, we're introducing a concept called a meta feed, which is basically a, a, a user that you subscribe to who uh, basically blacklists uh spam adverts and that kind of stuff. Um, now this is completely user config configurable. So in the UI, you can say, you can easily remove um, meta feeds, you can add new ones. Uh, if someone if someone's starting to get a bad reputation for blacklisting, you know, uh, properties that they shouldn't be, then you can easily remove them and, and find someone else who's doing a good job. And the incentive for these meta feeds to to do this uh, blacklisting is in return for uh, for their efforts, uh, they are able to um, post, uh, you know, promoted uh, listings or, you know, basically put a bit of flair on a listing to, um, and they can then sell that service to, to, li to listees. So a listee who might want to put, uh, you know, a nice a, a nice highlight over their listing, they can contact the meta feed and say, you know, I'd like to buy one of your promoted listings, uh, and this meta feed uh, might might have a pretty good subscription. You know, he's got a he's got a thousand users who subscribe to him, so you know, it it'd be a a good value transaction. So, so you talked about reputation. Is there some sort of a token that? represents reputation in Rex MLS? How do you establish reputation? Reputation for a meta feed would be quite, uh, would be quite different because it would mainly be how many, how many, how many uh, valid uh, spam listings has, has he blocked and how many people subscribe to his feed. Uh, so there wouldn't be uh, a single metric that that people can contribute to. It's more uh, how how successful is this meta feed would determine, uh, you know, how many how many people choose to subscribe to him basically. Okay, so uh, when when one of these participants points out a feed as being or listings as being spam, um, who who then uh, backs that up by saying, okay, if this was this was accurate. This is accurately spam or not? Like how? That, that's where I'm still not understanding. 
at the moment that would probably be more of a uh, of an off chain uh, process. So uh, uh, the users would uh, probably communicate over Reddit or some other uh, system that that uh, would be built that would review these uh, these meta feeds and uh, or it could even just be word of mouth. You know that uh, that that uh, this account here. Uh, has been doing an exceptional job and, and everybody subscribes to him. Uh, it's probably important to mention that uh, um, Rex will come with a built-in meta feed uh, that will be run by us and we will be flagging spam content. So in in most cases, that will be sufficient. Uh, we, you know, it's in our interest to, to ensure that we get rid of all the, the spam that shouldn't be there. Uh, but if anyone at any point decides that they don't trust us or, or, we're, or we're censoring uh, certain properties, then they can easily remove us and switch to somebody else. Okay. So let's talk about the token then, uh, the Rex token. What uh, utility does it serve in the system? Uh, the Rex token primarily is, is, to, pay, um, is to pay the, the listing fee. And, and as mentioned, that's m mainly to prevent spam. Um, it, 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 there'll be uh, further down the line. We've got two phases in this, which we'll touch on, um, I'm sure later. But um, we're going to add uh, plugins that'll have uh, comparable properties, uh, other other data that's relevant. That right now on the current systems, you have to, you know, pay a certain amount for. Uh, the Rex will act as sort of a uh, a gas or a um, uh, currency, I guess, to purchase these services or these plugins. I forgot to mention probably one of the most important things, which is uh, when people list a property, they can uh, allocate how much of the value of the property they wish to accept in Rex. Uh, so if you're selling a, a property for five hundred thousand dollars, you might say, uh, I would like to accept. Uh, I'm willing to accept up to a thousand dollars in Rex uh, as part of the trade. So, um, and the the idea here is that the more the more you the more percentage you pay you, you accept in your in selling of your property, uh, the, the more the the, the more preferential treatment you get in in listing uh, in the position of your listing in the system. So uh, we're, we're hoping that this incentivizes people to slowly increase their um, the percentage of recs that they accept as part of a of selling of a property, um, and 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 competition there should push that up. Uh, and if and if we start to see ten percent of of property sales. Uh, being settled in Rex, uh, then we've already we've already won. So uh, that, that's a very important feature. Okay. So what, when when you pay Rex to uh, to establish a listing, uh, you're you're burning that Rex essentially, or does it go to someone? Basically, the fees are collected into a uh, into a into a separate pot within the contract, uh, and uh, and then it's up to the Rex core dev team as as to what they do with those collected fees. Uh, basically, they have the choice of burning them outright. Uh, they have the choice of uh, using them to uh, add liquidity to the uh, Rex Dex order book and and buy tokens, um, or they can withdraw them uh, and use them to fund uh, development of the platform. Today's magic word is listing, L-I-S-T-I-N-G. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So there are lots of blockchain projects that are essentially trying to create an open data layer. What I mean by open an open data layer is a set of data items that are valuable when organized together for a large number of people and uh, most in most of the cases uh, this data is kind of centralized across various companies today and people imagine that the blockchain will be this open data layer blockchain ipfs will be this open data layer so other examples of such systems might be things people are building for media right 
uh, some people are building like content attribution systems like who created which song published on ipfs and blockchain or uh, there might be things like open bazaar right like uh, that's an open data layer that says who is willing to sell what right now as a, as an open data layer and in all of these open data layers uh, kind of projects and rex is one of them i would say once all of the data is open and now uh, rex has this requirement to pay 20 cents uh, using the rex token somebody else can any day come and create an alternative service which does not have this listing fee and because all of the data is open that other person can create us create the same service at at maybe very low cost so how do you defend against that i th- i believe that the 10 cents is a, is re- is in- insignificant enough to not be a huge problem uh and uh, and it and it does serve the purpose of reducing spam um i think someone who creates this system with no fee at all is going to struggle with uh with with a huge amount of of spam on the system and and all that does is is uh make 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 more work for the meta feeds to then have to be forever uh for chasing down the these spam posts and, and and blacklisting them so i don't see the 10 cents as as being a as a big issue uh it, it also has the added benefit of if those fees do get burned uh of reducing the supply of rex token and uh and and increasing its value so i think there's benefits in in the fee model uh and yeah look it, it would basically be up to to people to decide and and uh yeah i i think um i don't see a problem with the with the fee model to be honest the other, the other thing is too with the real with the real estate community with the crypto community it's easier to sort of jump ship from one platform to another uh but for the real estate community like i said their their main business and i think this will translate in other industries their their main business is uh transacting and building and obtaining real estate information so if there's a platform that works and they're used to it and the they they're used to one UI over another um they're going to go with what they're comfortable with and um with what costs obviously the least now if something's free but they're used to something else and the cost is nominal most likely they'll stick with what they know so my question is actually part of a broader set of questions which is for any business that's building an open data layer what is the moat what is the thing that defends that business against competitors jumping in and copying them at low cost and your answer to the, to it is uh, user comfort like the users are familiar with this set of user interfaces that you will develop for them and ultimately that is what makes them stick to stick to the rex service and not jump ship later look you guys know you guys have built uh, platforms getting a user base is is very difficult to do and once you are able to do that it's it's very difficult for somebody to come along and disrupt that we're we're running into that right now with going up against a company that is they're treating their customers in a way that just doesn't make sense but their customers have to put up with it so if someone comes along and offers uh rex you know forked and uh and it's free like russ touched on there's probably going to be a lot more spam um we don't know what it's going to be but to get that traction if you get that traction that's a very difficult thing to disrupt especially if you're treating your your users um fairly yeah the only other thing i was going to add to that is 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 if you're if you're looking at a, at investing in a in a platform uh and and one system uh has uh, has a supply that uh that can be reduced depending on how much usage it gets uh potentially increasing your investment in in the tokens that you in hold that you hold i mean uh or or choosing a a platform that that uh that has no that basically just slowly increases the the tokens uh you're financially better off choosing the one that uh might cost a uh an insignificant fee but uh potentially will see um the value of your tokens increase 
So com coming back to the token, uh, can you talk about how the tokens are distributed? Um, I so I reading the white paper mentioned you had this uh, li uh, liquidity injection distribution model. Can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, this is a, a novel uh, approach we've taken in to to solve this distribution problem uh, with a lot of with a lot of these tokens that are coming out. Uh, we we weren't comfortable with with assigning ourselves all of them or a large portion of them uh, from the outset. Uh, we were we were pretty hesitant even to uh, to go with the with the crowd fund, but but. Uh, you know, it'll it'll be really handy to to boost our our resources and development speed. So we we've gone with this zero token launch, um, and basically the only way to get hold of the Rex token is to uh, put buy orders on the order book, uh, and the order book will uh, every six hours it will calculate the top ten unfilled orders, and and basically just create or issue new tokens and give them to the to the top 10 orders. So uh, I, I believe this is a very fair way to do it uh, because you've got to put a buy order on the book, which is available for anybody to buy. So uh, you might want to win the, the liquidity injection and get some half price tokens, but someone can also come along and, and sell their RECs and take your order. So it, it's kind of like mining, but I think it's a very fair and and uh, and evenly distributed way of, of distributing the tokens. Okay, cool. So, um, so but also you, you mentioned, I think earlier that you're having a crowd sale. Uh, let's, uh, let's dive into that a little bit. Can you talk about the token sale? We have kicked off the contract uh, and it's, uh, I think the the uh, the token swap is due to to start in about six days, uh, and basically we're looking to raise uh, I think uh, was it about forty five thousand F. Um, that's our goal, and the the token swap will forcefully close itself um, once it reaches ninety thousand F, I believe, um, and basically this will give. Uh, Users a chance to basically buy bulk Rex um, before anybody else, um, and uh, yeah, the these Rex will they'll be issued with Rex reward points, which is basically just a uh, a receipt to say you you are eligible to claim uh, X number of Rex uh, when the claims process becomes active, and and we're looking to do that uh, when we go live proper. In about uh, three to six months, once uh, once we've bedded down the system over the next few months and and ironed out all the kinks. So, so Rex is not really a share in the system or a, or a security. It's 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 like it's like an entry fee to an amusement park. Right? Like whenever I'm a broker and I want to put something on the Rex system, then I and then I need to have this entry ticket, and that's the Rex token. Is that a right way to think of it? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. You'll you'll need a you'll need the Rex to use the system, but uh, it it won't entitle you to uh, dividends or shares or or equity in a, in anything. It's simply just a uh, a means to utilize the system. When when is it starting exactly, and and until when is it to go? It's set to run for about 14 days, but if it sees a huge amount of uh, interest, it, it will potentially end a lot earlier than that. Uh, I, in, instead of 14 days, we, we set it to 14 tranches of, of tokens um, uh, with, the, with, the ex, with the expectation that each tranche would be a day. Uh, but if there's a if there's a huge amount of interest, uh, those tranches will sell much faster than um, than 24 hours, and therefore the token swap could end um, uh, sooner than that. Uh, I I don't know the exact time. It, it's on the it's on the website. It's on the the DAP at the moment. Uh, it's it's about six days from now it starts. Um, yeah. Like it, it seems to me that. Um... Rex is going after the Ripple model, right? Like uh, they have this token XRP, 
which you need which you need to have you know in order to issue transactions on the ripple network but it's going for a much fairer and broadly distributed token supply right like like ripple is pretty concentrated in the in the hands of the core company but uh, in in case of rex you're targeting a more broad distribution um yeah look i i, I don't think it necessarily is uh just specific to Ripple, uh, I think I, I compare it similar to Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum, you need to hold some of the token to use the system. Um, yeah, but uh, you're right. It's uh, the distribution model is, uh, I think, as as fair as as we can get it. So look, it'll be interesting to see how the how this distri distribution model uh, plays out. Uh, it hasn't really been tried before. Um, yeah, so let's see how it goes. But I assume that you have a company of your own, right? That is also going to somehow have a different business model on the Rex, Rex platform. So, so there's there's the Rex the platform and the token, and that's open data. But do you do you guys have a, have a company as well that would want to build some service on Rex in the future and monetize that? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, in, uh, a separate company um, that we are, what we'll do is we'll build some of the plugins that we mentioned earlier. A lot of people uh, in the real estate community, which is a, an excellent use case for blockchain, are trying to do title um, and escrow services and contracts, cont contracts to some extent. Uh, Russ and I, we spoke about this when we first got a, got going with Rex, and um, we were sort of taking the Reed Hastings uh, Netflix approach, right? So when those guys got started, they uh, provided a convenient means to uh, mitigate the uh, retail experience by just ordering a video online and having it delivered to you. Uh, meanwhile, as the technology and the infrastructure developed, the bandwidth went up. Uh, they were able to, they're now like one of the biggest media platforms and uh, people are more comfortable with uh, subscription-based online models. Uh, we see the similar path for blockchain. So um, we feel it's, uh, the multiple listing service is a good entryway to get the brokerage community and the real estate community uh, comfortable with cryptocurrency. And as the infrastructure develops, uh, Adapt Central, we would like to provide plugins um, that would uh, adhere to uh, title, escrow services, um, like I said, some, some contracts, uh, you know, even eventually down the line, you could get into construction, uh, construction bonds and things of that nature. Let's, let's walk through all of these alternative places where blockchains and real estate could intersect. So one of the most common intersections that you find in many places is, is title, like some land registries and recording who owns what at, at what time instant. So I, I've seen that Factum was pretty active in, in, in this space. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Does it really make sense to have real estate linked to private keys that can be stolen? I, I do. I don't think right now it makes sense because uh, people aren't responsible or they're just not, they don't know how to deal with it yet. Um, even even some of the, the technical guys, you know, you misplace keys and, and they're gone. So I, I, like I said, as the infrastructure develops, I think that land registry and title makes perfect sense and it's a great use case and eventually it will be done. I, I just think, and, and Russ thinks um, collectively, that it's it's too early, um, and that some of these um, some of these processes need to be developed more. And once they are, th then it'll be a very efficient way to see who owned a property throughout the process. I mean, right now I'm in the process of buying a house, and the title company it's a great business to be in. It's uh, they they've got about eight thousand dollars in fees and they're just insuring about uh, against any possible cloud that could be in the title which if you look at the report there's none so they're they're basically printing eight thousand dollars and so on a residential level when you're buying a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house and you have an eight thousand uh, dollar title fee that's that's a big expense and that adds up and so you know that'll be a great use case to get rid of that you won't need that anymore um, so you know, but like I said, we believe it's it's a little early for that. 
uh, another interesting use case um, is uh, when you're looking to buy a property and you get uh, uh, you've got to go get a you know a building and pest inspection done and and usually you know there might be 50 people looking at the house and they and they've all got to go and pay for this silly pest inspection report at 500 bucks or a thousand bucks a pop uh, there there's there's some companies out there that are starting to try to uh, optimize that and improve that and and try to uh, and make that a bit more affordable uh, but I think uh, in an open data system uh, potentially those those pest reports could be uploaded into IPFS and uh, uh, the cost shared or or, uh, or or put up for free I think that's an interesting use case as well mm -hmm. And, and and what about like like really the real estate industry also has a big like financing component to it right so there's like trillions of dollars in mortgages these mortgages are taken and then they're bundled together and then securities are sold in these mortgages do you think that kind of uh, process could also map onto the black blockchain uh, yeah I we do uh, but I, I think that those are uh, they're gonna be there's a lot of fintech companies that are working in the banking industry that are trying to disrupt that process and a couple you know the stock market and a couple other financial instruments and um we're, we're not attacking that uh head on but i do believe that that a couple of these companies that are working on it will be successful and absolutely will will be able to incorporate that incorporate that into the rec system so just before we, uh, we wrap up here, coming to the end of the show, uh, one topic that comes up quite a lot uh, in discussions around the AOs is, is, is governance. Um, you, you mentioned earlier some things uh, regarding the um, regarding uh, fees, for instance, and that um, fees could be used to provide liquidity in the system or could be used to fund development and, and some other things. Um, how do you foresee these these decisions being made uh, moving forward? What type of governance models have you uh, envisioned for RexMLS? We've already built a uh, a decentralized governance uh, uh, application for 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 managing these kinds of uh, decisions. Um, so basically, the that that platform is will be integrated into Rex or it already is integrated into Rex. Uh, and, and it has, it, it's, it's kind of like a by invitation governance model. So users who have worked on the system, who have, who have uh, contributed over time and who, who the dev team or the, or the governance body deems as, uh, as trustworthy will be uh, brought into the, into the government governance uh, body, and uh, and then they will get a say in all the decisions that are made. So, to start with, it'll be uh, fairly small, just Stephen and I, most likely. Uh, but we, as the system grows and and the and the dev team gets larger, we will uh, you know incorporate and and include more and more people into that into that model okay so then decisions would get voted on in some sort of uh, a voting system so, I mean since there's no shares uh, what you're saying is that uh, any any sort of decisions around the code base or around how fees are get dis redistributed um, would uh, you know, those decisions would happen in this platform um, and in which I guess the members have voting rights is that how it works? Yeah, correct. So each each member has basically one voting right, uh, and, uh, uh, and and it's a hierarchical system so that you can include a group of uh, of ten developers under one uh, under one voting right. So those ten developers uh, will have their own governance uh, contract, and uh, and their vote will basically pull together and be one vote in the parent uh, in the parent contract. So it can scale out in, in any way you like. Um, but yeah, basically they they 
everyone gets one vote on on proposals, whether on what to do with the with the fees or, or whether to add new members into the into the body or uh, uh, yeah, anything that you want to do basically. And and it interacts directly with <clears throat> with uh, with the Rex contracts. So uh, you don't need to pick one person and say, okay, you do it. The the governance body will uh, interact with Rex and perform the actions if the uh, proposal was um, uh, whether it passed passed consensus. All right, great guys. Thanks uh, to Russell and Stephen for coming on the show today. It was great to talk about uh, Rex MLS and how you guys are disrupting the real estate market. Uh, it's it's sort of encouraging to see that you know you, you did mention that the real estate market was always the last uh, industry to uh, embrace new technologies, but it's it's quite encouraging to see that uh, that there's a lot of interest around uh, around blockchains in that industry. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thanks for having us on. Yep, we appreciate it. Thanks, guys. And we'll have links to uh, the Rex MLS uh, soft launch platform that we've just launched, actually, I, I think, uh, in well, you know, the last few hours. We'll have links to that in the show notes, along with uh, the white paper and other uh, documentation uh, about Rex MLS. So thanks to our listeners for tuning in. We are part of the LTB network. Uh, you can find lots of great shows about uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, and decentralized systems on letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, we release new episodes of Episode of Bitcoin every Monday. You can find us on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcast. And you can also download the video at uh, YouTube or watch the videos actually at youtube.com slash epicenter BTC uh, and of course uh, if you would like to leave us a review on iTunes you can do that and if, when you do just send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we'll send you a free t-shirt so thanks so much and we'll look forward to being back next week